Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with propositional logic, looking at the second set of answers to the problems I gave you on the rules of replacement. These are going to be some pretty tough problems because you're now allowed to use all 18 rules of inference. Let's take a look at the problems. So, here were the problems. If you want to stop or pause the video right now and try these problems on your own, I highly suggest that you do, and I encourage you to. And only when you get stuck or when you have a solution to come back and take a look at the answers that I'm about to provide. If you're done with these problems or you're inexorably stuck, come here, follow me, and we'll look at the answers. So, the first problem is premise 1, P and Q imply R, premise 2, Q, therefore P implies R. This problem is pretty simple once you notice that premise 1 is just a perfect example of the rule of exportation that we learned about earlier. So, first we'll have to switch around our P and our Q to do the exportation. We'll do premise 1, commutativity. Q and P implies R. Then, we will set up our exportation. Q implies P implies R from premise 3, exportation. And then, Premise 2, premise 4, modus ponens will give us P implies R, which is our conclusion. Not too bad. Basically, it's a good sampling of if you can use exportation correctly, and if you can understand what cases in which it should be used. Whenever you see a conjunction in front of an implication, you probably should start thinking about exportation in some way or another. Let's take a look at the next problem, which was P, if and only if Q, not P, therefore not Q. If you understand what that if and only if that material implication sign means, you should really see that it's a great example, a very clear example of a very valid and clear argument. However, in order to prove or to show that that works, we're going to have to use our new friend equivalence, material equivalence, the rule of replacement. So, I would do premise 3, P implies Q, and Q implies P from premise 1, equivalence. Note, you'll only use material equivalence when you have a triple bar, that if and only if, in one of the premises or in the conclusion. Because no other rules of inference use that triple bar, there's no other need for this rule. Then, just take and simplify premise 3 down to Q implies P. Take that not P, do a modus tollens to back up through premise 4, and get not Q from premise 2, premise 4, modus tollens. That's our not Q we were looking for. Once again, if you kind of understand the basic idea of material equivalence, this shouldn't have been a hard problem. Now, we're going to move into the tough ones. So, here we had P implies Q and R, and R or S implies T. And we're trying to conclude, eventually, P implies T. Hmm, this is pretty tough. Whenever I see a tough problem like this, I think there's going to be a distribution step in there. Distribution, for me at least, is that one rule that's really hard for me to easily wrap my mind around, or for me to see a clear pattern of where it's going to happen. For now, for this problem, what I'm going to do is just start playing with things that I can conclude from the premises. So, whenever I see a premise like premise 1, what I want to do is get rid of that implication and turn it into a disjunction because disjunction and conjunction can be used in a lot more ways together than implication and conjunction unless you're looking at a problem you might use exportation for. We can't use exportation here, so we're going to want to switch it to disjunction using our new rule called material implication. So we will get not P or Q and R from premise 1 implication. What are we going to do now? Well, I mentioned distribution, so let's give it a try. We'll do not P or Q and not P or R from premise 3, distribution. Now, what do I want to take out of this lovely conjunction? I can pick either side. I could either take not P or Q or not P or R. Well, if I look at where I'm eventually trying to end up, I'm trying to end up with T. Q doesn't really help me to get to T. I have in premise 2, R or S implies T. R, on the other hand, might be more helpful for me to get towards T. So we'll pull out the second part of that. And we'll take not P or R from premise 4. Simplification. Well, not P or R is just so perfectly placed in a way that it could turn an implication. Why not? We'll turn it back into P implies R from premise 5. Implication. Now, 
I feel we've kind of exhausted what we're going to do with that first premise. Sure, we could simplify premise 4 down to not P or Q as well and get P implies Q, but that's not really going to help us on our quest for P implies T. Let's take a look at our second premise now. We have R or S implies T. Once again, I'm going to try a similar method to ending up with something that's going to help us. If you want to stop the video now, if you were confused for the first part, and just kind of try those steps and those ideas on that second part, I'd highly suggest you do. But if you've already done that, or you just want me to give you the answer, follow me. So, what I would do now is once again do implication on premise 2 to get not R or S or T, because we're going to be able to do a lot more with just disjunctions, then we're going to do De Morgan's Law to get that negation inside those parentheses, because we can't do distribution with that negation outside. Then we'll do commutativity to set up once again. We're trying to set up for this great distribution like we did earlier. T or, not R and not S. And then we'll finally do a distribution. T or not R and T or not S. Premise 9, distribution. Now, once again, we're looking for which of these two do we want to simplify down to? Well, S isn't really going to help us. That wasn't featured in our first premise, and P doesn't really have anything to do with S. However, as we learned earlier, P does have something to do with R. We saw that in premise 6. So, let's take out the T or not R. If we do that, T or not R, premise 10 simplification, and then switch them around in order to set up, putting it back into a nice little implication again. That's not R or T, premise 11, commutativity. And finally, R implies T from premise 12, implication. Now, it should be clear what we've been moving towards this whole time is setting up a lovely hypothetical syllogism between premises 6 and premise 13. To get P implies T, premise 6, premise 13, hypothetical syllogism, which is the conclusion of our argument. That problem was really tough because it kind of required a lot of forethought. You had to be able to see that eventually you might be setting up something that looks like a hypothetical syllogism. When I was doing this problem personally, I just concluded as many things as I could from premises 1 and 2 and eventually ended up with P implies R and P implies T through R implies T, which gave me my answer. But... The best thing to do with problems like this is just something like that. Conclude as many things as you possibly can that are logically valid from your premises, and eventually you'll end up with your answer. There are skills to get there faster, but that's the best way to do it. Trial and error. Now, let's move on to the final problem. This is a very hard problem. We have premise 1, P implies Q, and premise 2, R implies S. And we want to conclude P or R implies Q or S. Wow. Looking at this, you have really simple premises and a really complex conclusion. I, originally, had no idea where to start, and it was really confusing and really tough. But what I did was said, okay, I'm going to look at the conclusion, I'm going to kind of try to work backwards in some sense. What I have to do what's important is I need to somehow go from grouping P and Q together to grouping P and R together, and go from grouping R and S together to grouping somehow Q and S together. It's a tough thing, but we're going to try it, and I'm going to try out different things and see eventually what we can get from that. So, what I'm going to do is P implies Q or S. Like I said, I want to bring that S in somehow. I'm going to go, that's just premise one addition. Then, because once again, like I said, an implication and disjunction aren't going to do you much good. Two disjunctions, you can do a lot more with that. So, I'll take premise three implication to get not P or Q or S. Then we'll do associativity. Once again, I said I'm trying to get that Q and the S together. So I get not P or Q or S from premise 4, associativity. I'm going to do a similar thing now to R implies S. Once again, I'm trying to get now the Q into this equation. We'll do R implies S or Q from premise 2 addition. Then not R or S or Q, premise 6 implication. Once again, trying to get disjunctions only here, then we'll switch over those parentheses to not R or S or Q, premise 7, associativity. Now we basically have set up not P or Q or S, and not R or S or Q. It's really, really close. We're going to do a quick commutativity to get both of those ending in Q or S. And now we've set up what's a really, really tricky move. It's going to be backwards distribution. We're going to conjoin these two premises into this long monster of 
Not P or Q or S, and not R or Q or S. The only redeeming quality that that premise has is the second part of both those mini disjunctions inside is the same. It's Q or S. So we can do distribution backwards to get not P and not R or Q or S. Premise 10 distribution. Whew. That was the tough part. From here on out, should be pretty straightforward of going to this, from this to the conclusion. Let's take a look. We then will do implication from premise 11 to get not, not P and not R implies Q or S. Then we'll do De Morgan's rule to bring that negation inside those parentheses. And two rounds of double negation will end us with our final conclusion of P or R implies Q or S from premises 13, premise 14, double negation. Wow, that was a lot of work. If you were able to do that on your own, you should feel very, very confident and very, very good about your skills with logic and the rules of inference. That was the second set of problems and the second set of answers for the rules of replacement. Next up, we're going to be, to finish out and to round out our study of propositional logic, we're going to be looking at two skills and two techniques for solving problems like this that will make nasty problems like that much, much easier, known as conditional proof and indirect proof. And after that, we're going to be moving on to categorical logic. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnadies.org. And stay skeptical, everybody.